on this panel on looking after after we had the first panel titled on listening. Um, we also wanted to address kind of um, in the similar inquiries uh, in a way of sensing by um, by using the methods of looking, and um, we want to explore um, different layers of looking, such as the gaze, which is the researcher's gaze, as well the archival gaze, also the vision, the eye, and also the tools, such as the camera, the microscope, the written text. And here we already have three speakers with us. Um, we have Wim Manuhutu, we have Pamela Patinama and Paul Bill. I will um, tell a bit about them, their short bio, when they come, but briefly, um, what will happen in this panel, um, Wim will speak about um, room views, a very peculiar um, scientist who is actually blind and he will explore the, um, he, he, will, he will use room views and his, um, from his archives to think about how to decolonize this kind of scientific knowledge which was produced by him. And we will also, secondly, we will have Pamela Patinama who will um, deals with post-colonial um, okay, post archives, mostly containing family photographs and snapshots, to think that as uh, tools of self-fashioning and suggesting how Indo-Europeans negotiated a politics of difference as opposed to a politics of imitation and reputation. And lastly, we will have Paul Bill, who will speak about perhaps vision as a, another aspect of looking. Well, he will talk about the ideas of human equality and uh, human rights, which are often framed as Western, but he will also look um, engaging with Indonesian Dutch colonial archives from another perspective, perhaps decolonizi uh, decolonization as a perspective and methods to uh, draw attention to the continuing thinking in terms of ine in inequality in both countries through processes of, among others, racializations, gendering, and sexualization. So um, we will start with Wim Manuhutu. Wim Manuhutu is, uh, was trained as a historian at Utrecht University. And he, um, from 1987 to 2009, he was one of the directors of the Malukan Museum in Utrecht. Now he is an independent researcher and curator at Manuhutu and his interests include Indonesian and, and post-colonial Dutch history, diversity in Netherlands, and issues of race. At present, he is working on a PhD thesis on the cultural relations between Netherlands, Suriname, and Indonesia after 1945. So, Wim? Ah, there are you. <laughs> there you are. We can start with you now. Thank you for this, uh, this kind introduction. Um, and I was actually making some, uh, some pictures, so I was looking uh, at, at you while you were uh, introducing the panel. Rimfius was here, um, literally. Um, he is here in this, in this very building in, in more ways than, than one. And what I want to do in this very short presentation is actually to bring out the fact that we need to know more about Rimfius in order to take him apart uh, in a good way. Uh, obviously, uh, to, to decolonize our perception of Rumphius and the way that he worked in his uh, day and age and the way that it, his legacy is still with us. So if we go to the Tropen Museum in uh, Oswald, we will encounter uh, Rumphius, the mannequin of, of Rumphius, uh, in the very beginning of, uh, of the exhibition as he represents that part of the Dutch encounter, and of course, it's always very uh, dangerous to talk in terms of encounters because it has the tendency to basically wipe out uh, all the nasty parts of encounter uh, uh, when you talk just about encounter and engagement and things uh, and, and terms like terms like that. Uh, but in this section of the of, of the exhibition, of course, Rumphius represents basically the gathering, the production of knowledge about Asia, and in this case, particular part of, of Asia, the eastern part of the Indonesian archipelago, the Moluccas, Ambon, 
the blind seer of Ambon, that was his uh, nickname, the Blindesiener von, von Ambon, and it was in the subtitle of, you see, the, the front of, of this, uh, this etching was used uh, for a small book that was published in the beginning, actually, of World War II, and it was titled The Blindesiener von Ambon. Uh, on the left, we see the Rumpfius uh, commemorative coin, uh, a boat, a ship by the uh, Royal Dutch, um, not the Navy, but the company that, um, that surfaced the, the islands in, the colonial, uh, in colonial Indonesia, was called the Rumpfius. And then we have a plaque also commemorating uh, Rumpfius. And the commemoration of, of Rumpfius has been a part of uh, what makes Rumpfius so extraordinary. In scientific circles, botanist, biologist, maritime biologist, Rumpfius is a household name as being one of the first who uh, studied uh, marine life, life in, uh, in general uh, in, in Ambon and, and, and its surroundings. And the fact that he became blind basically adds to the fascination of, of many who have engaged uh, with uh, Rumpfius in, uh, in the past. And we see that reflected in, in all these beautiful uh, publications, uh, the Ambon Serariteitenkamer, uh, Professor, uh, late Professor Beekman um, made it his life work basically to, to, study, uh, to study Rumpfius and publish all his works and translate them into English. And uh, this is what always happens. He was at odds with the other person, the late Mr. Bowser, who also made it his life work to, to basically know everything about, about Rumpfius. And what they did was to focus on Rumpfius, the scientist. But if you look at Rumpfius, obviously, he started out uh, as a soldier, later becoming a merchant, and then later on becoming the scientist who became world famous. So the knowledge that he gathered and produced was gathered and produced in the colonial situation where in Ambon, Rumpfius arrived after decades of war in, in order to establish the monopoly on spices that according to Dutch historian Gerrit Knaap, who is a specialist in, in Ambon in the 17th century, uh, had as a result that one third of the population of Ambon and the surrounding islands has per had perished, either directly through war or through famines or otherwise. So the knowledge that Rumpfius has gathered is not innocent. And that is, by and large, by many uh, people who deal with Rumpfius, well, they make this reference to the fact that, of course, he was a VOC employee but the violence that surrounds the production of knowledge uh, of, of Rumpfius is often left out of the story. And it is fo the focus is on the personal tragedy of Rumpfius losing his wife and his daughters after a, a, an earthquake, losing the manuscripts that were sent to, to Europe. So there's enough drama in the life of Rumpfius without it seems many people have thought going into the drama that was happening in the, in the Moluccas. If you look at the works that uh, deal with Rumpfius, obviously you see this recurring pattern where Rumpfius is highlighted, but all his assist assistants be remain in the shadows. They are, these are the people who drew after he got blind, the people who helped him, the people who gathered the information, these people remain nameless and, and faceless. And of course, being in, uh, located in the 17th century, also the explanations by Rumpfius sometimes reflect 17th century science rather than modern science. Nevertheless, he is still considered to be one of the forerunners of, of biology, of, of, of botanomy uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia. And he was famous in his lifetime. He, um, he wrote with all kinds of scholars in, in Europe. And after he passed away, a monument 
which is in the right lower corner of this uh, page from the early 19th century, was already erected in, in Ambon. And we see here in the 30s of the 20th century, colonial officers paying tribute, homage to, uh, to Rumphius being the great scholar uh, he is. So that is the sustaining power of, of Rumphius. Even to this very day, and even though parts of the monument have been replaced by modern day Indonesian uh, plaquettes reproducing the text that were on the, was on the original monument, the monument is still there in the city of Ambon. You can actually go there and see it. The nice thing, though, is that it also is a monument that is slowly crumbling. Uh, you see on the left uh, a photograph when the monument was still pretty well looked after, and then on the, uh, in the middle a photograph I took a couple of weeks ago, and there was actually a garbage bin in front of the monument. I took it away, or we took it away, because it would be too easy to photograph the monument with the garbage bin as a sign of, well, look at how things are being kept here uh, in, in present-day present day Ambon. We have a Rumphius library, uh, an enormous archive of knowledge, basically in Dutch, so inaccessible to a lot of people uh, who live in Ambon now. And it, it basically reflects the fact that a lot of the knowledge that was produced by Rumphius and others like him um, is there, it's inaccessible, and by being inaccessible, it becomes a sort of a magical power. What Rymphius has said, stated, is true, because we have no means to really understand and to contextualize the knowledge that Rymphius uh, gathered and others, and others like him. So in Ambon, to many young people also, Rumphius is a magic name. You have the Rumphius community that has over 1,600 members, the majority being located in Indonesia, and they are very much interested in Rumphius, even in his silsila, in his uh, family tree. One could imagine, I'm a young person in Ambon, why would I care about the silsila of a German in the 17th century, but this is the power of Rumphius. What I do think is extremely important is to not only read against the archival grain, but read along the archival grain, as uh, Laura Ann Stoller has said. We need to study, we need to know what Rumphius and others like him who produced knowledge in a colonial context um, produced we need to know Dutch, to learn Dutch as Indonesians, as Ambonese in this case, in order to be able to critically reflect on what Rumphius has said. Now, people sometimes come to me and ask, Pavim, uh, they're very deferential, they're younger, so they, they would say, Pavim, we have these texts by Rumphius, could you help us translating? Of course, anything more than four pages becomes a problem because time is, uh, is always limited. But it is, I think, very important for them to have direct access to the, to the archives. So then it's, it's basically one of the ways to pull away the curtain and expose Rumphius for who he is, not as a fraud, but as a person who is located in a certain colonial uh, situation. And his knowledge is situated and what we need to do is to basically deconstruct Rumphius in order to appreciate him better, but in a more modern, post-colonial way. And I think this museum, any scientific institution in the Netherlands, has a role to play in order not only to give access, but to actually facilitate researchers and to engage with researchers in a critical way in order to do so and to take this next step in decolonizing the archives. Thanks. <laughs>